view of marriage. And I did that intentionally. Yes, yes. Um, the Supreme Court had a ruling, five to four. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? That, that five, verse, uh, five people could redefine how we see marriage and what marriage is. I, I hope that this morning the message will be an encouragement to you, especially if you are married, that you'll think about what that marriage means. If you're thinking about it, I like to say this when I'm doing a wedding, and especially to the, to the people that are up front. Oftentimes the people who are up front are the ones who might not yet be married, and they actually, who knows, might meet somebody in the wedding party that might become their, their future bride or groom. And so I encourage them to you know watch the couple observe them and see what they're like and, and see the commitment that they're making to one another. Uh, and, and there's a great opportunity for them to learn about marriage simply by continuing to be a part of that couple's married life. Well, I hope today we'll bring out some of the positive things about marriage. Uh, but I thought it's important to share something with you. I have a, a plaque that I received from a gentleman named John Marshall. John was a missionary uh, in uh, Zaire. And he and his wife, Gloria, in fact, uh, served there for many, many years. John became our uh, area minister. At that time, it was the title for the person who worked with churches, helping in pastoral transitions, in conflict resolution, various things like that. And John was the area minister for Arizona. The date on here is March 10, 1985. That was my first Sunday, the day I was installed uh, the first time as a senior pastor. Uh, at, at a place called Second Baptist Church in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, it, it was a church that uh, later I learned that they had just recently voted as to whether they were going to close the church or not. And it only failed by one vote. So if one person switches, the church is closed, and I don't go to Phoenix that year. Interesting about that. Uh, afterwards, I knew why. No, <laughs> seriously, I did. Uh, but when, when John was installing, he gave the, he gave the message. That, and John was a guy that I'd gotten to know over the years um, from my work in, in uh, the churches in, in American Baptist churches of the Pacific Southwest. And, and uh, we'd followed and prayed for him in their missionary work. We'd help support them in church buildings that they made, built in Zaire. I think that's called now the Congo or something. I don't remember. But anyways, uh, John, John gave this plaque to me and he preached this sermon. And he said, Sola scriptura, sola gratia, fiducia obedentia. Installed as senior pastor, Reverend William P. Mellinger, March 10, 1985. Now what do those three phrases mean? Sola scriptura, only the scripture. And, and these are actually the, the watch cry, if you will, of the Reformation. The Reformation was built on this thought. We're going to build our faith, our relationship, our understanding totally and only on what Scripture says. And if you think about that, how do we make our decisions upon what God is trying to teach us? Don't we need to look to the Bible? Now, the danger is we all can look to personal opinion. We can look to others' opinion. We can look to culture and sociology and things like that. But the bottom line is, first and foremost, and I as a preacher am going to say, what does the Bible say? And I want to base what I share with you on the Word of God. I'm committed to that. What does the Word of God say? And I'm going to stand on that word. The second phrase is sola gratia, only grace. It's by grace we are saved through faith. This not of ourselves, lest anyone should boast. It's a gift that God gives us. None of us deserves it. None of us can earn it. You cannot work your way into heaven. But because you know Christ, that leads us to the third phrase, because you know Christ, you are going to be committed to fiducia obedentia, faithful obedience. Faithful obedience. It's tough sometimes. I remember the day that I met with a couple and I had just received a phone, well actually quite a long conversation with a, a local pastor. And he says, um, Bill, I understand you're getting ready to marry this couple. Yes. He says, well Bill, the gentleman has been under discipline in our church and we have been working to save their marriage. And I'd like you to ask you not to do the wedding. Did I tell you that this, the daughter was the daughter of the chairman of the board of deacons? 
<laughs> Senior pastor um, was on vacation. And then I met with a couple and I said, um, understand that you're under discipline from your home church. In other words, they're trying to save your marriage and have you worked on it yet? And I said, uh, I can't do your wedding. <clears throat> Tough moment. I can't do your wedding because if the Bible says you're under discipline and, and, and God says that you need to work on that marriage, then you better work on that first and have you. And he hadn't. He said, then, then, then really, it, it would be wrong of me to do your wedding right now unless you've worked on that relationship with that wife and you've allowed the people who are trying to godly guide you to help you. And if you've given it your all and for some reason it's not going to work, it's maybe a different place. But right now, I can't do the wedding. Well, senior pastor came back and um, he decided it was too uh, political of a situation and he went ahead and did the wedding. He didn't try to force me to do it or anything like that, but he went ahead and did the wedding. Um, there are tough decisions we have to make in ministry. And sometimes there's lines literally that are drawn and scripture draws those lines. Now I, obviously, sometimes we interpret those lines differently, don't we? Some of you may have said, you know, well, gee, Bill, so many people get divorced, why didn't you just do the wedding? I mean, so what if there was another church involved that had been working on the marriage? I mean, just do it, right? It's okay. Really? See, I... I, I I, as a man trying to follow God, believe that the Bible is my best protector, guide, principle for living my life. And um, that means there's times I'm going to make some tough decisions. So there was a time that, and there's been more than one, where we've had to say to somebody, you know, what you're doing is sin. For example, living together. And, and folks, we have this, don't we, even all different ages, don't we? Uh, we have some people even older who will live together with people because, and they say, well, because I can't, I don't want to lose my social security. So let me see. Based on finances and government, we're going to make certain spiritual decisions. And what are we modeling to grandchildren? I mean, there's all kinds of issues here, right? Well, everyone else is having sex. Why can't we have sex before we get married? I need to try it out, right? I need to make sure. I mean, come on. You've heard the, you've heard the argument, right? You, you wouldn't go buy a brand new car without trying it out, would you? So I need to see if this is going to work or not. Well, frankly, the, the problem with that is twofold. Number one, you're never going to find out if it's going to work until you commit yourself and stay in it and don't leave it. And there is no exit plan. You're committed for life. And secondly, the, the fact is, is that... It doesn't work to try it out. I, I'm, I'm going to warn you right now that the, the rate of divorce of couples who have tried out having sex together and living together because it's kind of the thing and way to do it, the failure rate is horrendous. Way beyond those. And yes, I understand that many today are not making that commitment. It's way beyond those who say, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do this the way God said to do it. There are tough things in the Bible. Have you noticed? Tough lessons to be learned. But there's blessings that come with following those lessons. What is God's view of marriage? Today, I, I want us to try to look at God's view, the scriptural view. Uh, I will make some co cultural comments, but I really want us to give our attention to God's view for marriage. I want us to try to base things sola scriptura. I don't want us to miss out that grace is very, very critical. If we're ever going to point out that the people have sinned, we have to do it from a place of grace, not a place of judgment. Is that true? All have sinned, we've said it already, and fallen short of the glory of God. But therefore, should we sin because that way we get more grace? No, Paul says, by no means. 
But we should have an attitude of love, of compassion, of concern. If we're going to say to somebody, and, and you try this out, any, are there any parents in the crowd? If you get real mean-spirited with your child and tell them to do something, are they going to like it? Even if you do it graciously, they may not like it. Would you please pick up your clothes off the floor so that I don't need to do that? I don't want to, right? <laughs> we, don't like, we don't like to have our shortcomings pointed out to us. It's a fact. But one of the most important texts for parents, in addition to honor your mother and father that it may go well with you, the only commandment with a promise, one of the most important texts is the father disciplines those he loves. The father disciplines those he loves. There's not a person who has come to Jesus who hadn't had some point of being cut to their heart and saying, I have sinned and I need Christ to pay for my sin. I need his forgiveness. We look at that, and there's different ways of preaching that, right? We can preach the need for forgiveness in a way that, you know, you're all going to hell, you evil people, now straighten up! And you're all going to say, yes, sir, right? <laughs> or we can say, God has something better for you. That grief, that shame, that guilt that you feel, God wants to set you free from that. God wants to forgive you of those places where you know you've missed it. And he wants to make you into a brand new person because he loves you and he has this gift for you. See, there's different ways of preaching it, aren't there? And so I, I, I'm simply saying this kind of because I'm getting ready for what I'm going to say next week. And, and as you continue to look at our statement on, human, on marriage and human sexuality, there's some pretty clear things that I believe that God's trying to teach us about from his word. And so let's see what he says. I think it's helpful to, to begin with um, Genesis, the second chapter. And there's two texts that I'm kind of looking at and paralleling today. The first one is Genesis 2, 20 to 25. <coughs> so the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam... No suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. <laughs> Scripture only. Are we going to be able to look at Scripture only for our guide to marriage? The fact is, is that our Supreme Court has said that marriage is what? Not limited to man and woman. That's what the Supreme Court has ruled. I want you to consider a gentleman named Luke Timothy Johnson. He's a New Testament scholar and professor. He um, personally has had a change of heart regarding uh, homosexual practice in the Bible. And he states, The task demands intellectual honesty. I have little patience with efforts to make Scripture say something other than what it says through appeals to linguistic or cultural subtleties. The exegetical situation is straightforward. We know what the text says. Did I say he had a change? He, he believes that homosexuality and homosexual marriage is okay. Did you hear what I just said? The task demands intellectual honesty. I have little patience with efforts to make Scripture say something other than what it says through appeals to linguistic or cultural subtleties. The exegetical situation is straightforward. We know what the text says. You know what he says the text says? Marriage is a man and a woman. That's what he says the Bible says. 
He goes on. But what are we to do with what the text says? We must state our grounds for standing in tension with the clear commands of Scripture and include in those grounds some basis in Scripture itself. To avoid this task is to put ourselves in the very position that others insist we already occupy, that of liberal despisers of the tradition and of the church's sacred writings, people who have no care for the shared symbols that define us as Christian. If we see ourselves as liberal, then we must be liberal in the name of the gospel and not, so, and not as so often has been the case, liberal despite the gospel. But what if this means rejecting what the Bible clearly teaches, the name of the gospel? Johnson goes on, he says, I, I, write, I think it important to state clearly that we do in fact reject the straightforward command of Scripture and appeal instead to another authority when we declare same-sex unions can be holy and good. What authority is he referring to? We appeal explicitly to the weight of our own experience and the experience thousands of others have witnessed to, which tells us that to claim our own sexual orientation is in fact to accept the way in which God has created us. By so doing, we explicitly reject as well the premises of the scriptural statements condemning homosexuality. Namely, that it is a vice freely chosen, a symptom of human corruption and disobedience to God's created order. Do you hear what he's saying? Instead of scripture, he says, I'm going to base things on experience. And our experience is what's going to judge whether scripture is true or not, and whether we're going to follow it or not. I'm thinking that's on somewhat dangerous ground. I'd like to read a prayer and have you try to pray this with me for the next few moments. <coughs> Dr. Brown writes to judge or not to judge, and he says, Let's, we need to pray this prayer. Please join me. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to help me to open my heart and my mind to your truth, whatever the cost or consequence. Help me to humble myself and to be teachable and correctable. And in keeping with your promises, lead me in the way of truth and life and freedom. Where I have been deceived, undeceive me. And where I have hardened my heart through sin, pride, fear, tradition, control, or man-made religion, forgive me and cleanse me. Lord, I want to please you, not myself. And more than anything in this world, I just want to love you, know you, and live for, your, for you. By your grace, I will. In Christ's name, amen. The Bible teaches that marriage is a covenant between a man and a woman and God. A covenant. It's not merely a contract. It's a spiritual union between a man and a woman and God. And if you look at the Bible, the Bible, if I could use this term, the Bible is a heterosexual book. All throughout, all throughout the book, every single reference to marriage in the entire Bible speaks of what? A relationship between a man and a woman. A man takes a wife. There is this union that comes. Uh, every warning to men about sexual purity presupposes what? Relationship between men and women. With a married man often warned not to lust after another woman. Jesus even said, if you thought it in your head, you're already in trouble. You've already committed the sin. Every discussion about family order and structure speaks explicitly in heterosexual terms, referring to husbands and wives, fathers and mothers. It's every, it's every discussion, every law or instruction given to children presupposes what? Heterosexuality, as children are urged to heed or obey, to follow the counsel and the example of their father and mother. 
Every parable, every illustration, every metaphor having to do with marriage is presented clearly in male and female terms. In the Old Testament, God depicts his relationship with Israel how? The book of Hosea is one of the great examples of a, of a bad relationship, in fact. But it's depicted as a groom and a bride. In the New Testament, the image shifts to the union between a husband and wife as a picture in Ephesians 5 of what? Of Christ and the church. And in Revelation, ultimately, the church is that bride of Christ that will come down beautifully adorned for her groom, the husband, Jesus Christ. And since there's no such thing as in vitro fertilization and the like in biblical times, the only parents were heterosexual. Still took a man and a woman, still does, to produce a child. The Bible is a heterosexual book. Now, now, before you go too far, I'm going I mean, to have to keep kind of doing this jump over here too because that doesn't mean that therefore we should get mean-spirited, unkind, and unloving to somebody who's making choices with their life. Our culture has tried to teach that we choose, excuse me, that we are created with a certain behavior, a certain identity, and, and a certain sexuality. And the fact is, is that science has nothing to prove that. Every scientific study has been unable to prove that you're created with a certain sexual tendency. Here's what we're created with. We're created to honor God. And every single one of us has taken on a sin nature when we were born into this world. And every single one of us has a variety of different kinds of sins and temptations. Every one of us. So what? We're all born, born to be like Christ, but born with sin. And the temptation is varied and many for all of us. There's not a person that avoids it. Okay, there's four things I think I want to try to bring up to you today about marriage. Number one, marriage is a gift from God. It's a gift! I'm, I'm going through this stuff and getting ready for this Sunday and I'm like, you know, why am I getting all discouraged and depressed and feeling down? This, should be a, this is a really good thing. God gave us a gift. This is an, it's an incredible gift. God brings man and he puts him to sleep because he couldn't find a helpmate ready for him. He looked at all of the animal life, right? Including orangutans, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> and elephants and horses and dogs, man's best friend. Everyone. And he said, not a single one of them is, is appropriate, is adequate, can meet the needs of this man. Not a single one of them can stand beside this man, team up with this man, and accomplishes the purposes that I have for this man and the relationship I want him to experience. And so he puts him to sleep. And he gives him this gift. And he takes the rib out from his chest. And from that rib now, he forms woman. And he wakes man back up and he says, look, here is your helpmate. Here is the one to come alongside of you. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, this is before the fall. Okay? This is before sin sets in. This is before we start messing everything else up. It's when God's made everything good. In fact, he himself at the creation of mankind says, and it was what? Very good. Very good. And man, man is, as Adam, Ish, looks at Isha, this, this creation made from his own body, and he looks at her and says, Ongawa. Excuse me, I apologize for that. <laughs> he looks at her and he says, this is wonderful because marriage is a gift that God's given to us, a partner to be with us in life, a partner to share life's experiences with us, our ups, our downs, our frustrations, yes, even to fight with us at times, right? I mean, what spouse hasn't helped shape the other spouse, help them become more of a, the better person that they can be? Marriage is a gift from God, even though some of us abuse the gift, mess up the gift, Ruin the gift. Marriage is a gift from God. Ephesians 5 says, Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Marriage is a gift. Husbands and wives, 
It's a treasure that you've been given, this opportunity to be partners with somebody else. And it is a gift to be able to love someone else more than yourself. Narcissism is a problem. Who wants to kiss themselves in the mirror? It's not rewarding, I can promise you. Okay? God has created us to be in relationship like the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a communion together, a unity with one another. God's created us and given us this gift, this treasure to be able to enjoy someone else and to love them with our whole heart. And I should jump back to one verse, which I'm going to come to later. Ladies, it says, respect your husband. Okay? Marriage is a gift that involves love and respect. And you don't have a healthy marriage without both. Ladies, I I just got to be straightforward with you. Some of you have not respected your spouse. You've heard the command, love your wife like Christ loved the church. And and you focused there and said, that's what marriage is all about. It's about the wife. It's about the husband loving the wife, bowing down, serving her, sacrificing himself for her. And he should do all those things, yes? But ladies... It says, respect your husband. Hold him in high regard. It's at the core of what both men and women need. Now, we all need love and respect, yes? But at the core of what men need is somebody who believes in them, who will hold them in high regard, who will respect them as they are, not put them down. And at the core of what a lady needs is to have somebody who says, I honor you. I cherish you. You are special to me. And I'll lay down my life for you. I'll sacrifice for you because I love you. Now, don't miss it. Husband needs to be loved too, doesn't he? Well, I respect you, dear. Don't love you, though. No, a man still needs to be treasured, right? And, and doesn't a woman need respect? You know, hey, you're supposed to do whatever I say. You know, beat her up and whatever. <laughs> right? No. No, no. A woman needs respect, too. But don't miss that God created us. Men with a greater need for respect and women with a greater need for love. And together, we bring that together and we form a marriage, we form a team, a partnership that's unbeatable. It's so special, it's so powerful that Jesus said, wherever two of them are, you are gathered together in my name. There I am in the midst of you. You can ask anything at all. And if you're in agreement, guess what? I'm gonna do what you ask. And why in the world would he do that? Because he set up this team. Do you see it? God. Husband, wife, a team. And that team, when they agree, miracles can happen. Marriage is a gift from God. But marriage also is a responsibility, isn't it? The man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Adam says, hey, she came out of me. (laughs) All right? She's part of me. She, She matters to me. And because of that, there's a responsibility that I have for her because she came from me. Ephesians 5.28 says, In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. You have a responsibility to take care of your partner. Marriage is that responsibility. Marriage is about, number three, love and respect. And this is what I was touching on already. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. There's a word that we sometimes don't like. The word is headship. Right? But notice, I think God is is poetically amazing. (laughs) Where does the bone come from that God uses to make woman? Not from the foot, so he can step on her. Not from the head, so she can step on him. But from where? Right here by the heart. The rib. So she can be next to him. I got to tell you, I have a beautiful bride. An exceptional lady. And I like to hug her, 
to simply put my arm around her and be next to her. And marriage is about us showing love and respect to one another. So wives, submit yourselves. And in case you don't like that word, which I know it's sometimes has its own irritation, right? The word for submit is respect. It doesn't say, go be stepped on, go be a nothing, go, go be a carpet, go be dirt. No, 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 no. It says, you should respect. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And incidentally, I just read verse 21 from Ephesians 5. What did it just say? Did you hear it? It said, girls, do whatever the guy says, right? <laughs> I know that probably would get me in trouble if she did anyways. <laughs> it says, and this is key, you cannot go to verse 20 without doing verse, excuse me, you cannot go, cannot go to verse 22 without doing verse 21. It says, submit to one another out of what? Reverence for Christ. There's that holy triangle again, isn't it? So cool. Submit to one another, husbands and wives. You submit to each other. In other words, respect each other. As you have this respect, this reverence, this, this worship of God, as you put him up here, respect one another out of your reverence for Christ. Because Christ matters to you. Because guess what? But since you're so imperfect, which we all are, we need to have an example. We need to have an image. We need to have somebody who's going to help us become more like Christ. Don't leave the spouse you're having problems with because they're helping you become more like Jesus. Maybe because of the way they treat you, but who knows? But they're helping you to become more like Christ himself. So don't run from it. Marriage is about love and respect. He goes on, verse 23. For the husband, oh, there's that word. The husband is the what, ladies? The head of the wife. As Christ is the head of the church. His body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit, should submit to their husbands in everything. As the church, the body of Christ, respects Christ, so also a wife is called, and it's as much a command as it is to the men to love. Do you get it? It's as significant a command as when he says, love your wives, respect your husband. You gotta have both for the partnership to work well. Marriage is about love and respect. And the fourth thing I'd want you to know this morning is that marriage is supposed to be permanent. It's what God wants. Here's where I need to put in one of those parentheses. I understand that there are people in this room that have gone through a divorce. You've suffered the pain of the broken relationship. And there may be a variety of reasons for that. And really, the reason for it is not important at this moment. You've experienced the breaking. There's hurt that you've carried with you because of that. And God didn't want that. Now, it may have been because of an abusive relationship. And God doesn't want an abusive relationship, does he? It may have been because uh, one of the partners was unfaithful. And God doesn't want unfaithfulness in marriage. In fact, he writes a whole book called the, the Book of Hosea. And it's all about what? An unfaithful wife. An unfaithful wife who sells herself as a prostitute. And she does it again and again and again. And finally, she's sold as a slave. And the husband comes to the center of the town, to the slave market, and he sees his wife up there, and she's for sale. It's time for him to finally get rid of her, right? And what does he do? Hosea says he buys her back. He pays, he pays the price for her. He purchases her and gives her her freedom. Why? 
because he loves her. And then Hosea tells us that that's the story of God and his people. Because Israel is the bride that keeps prostituting herself. And God is the gracious God who purchases her back with his blood and pays for her freedom. Marriage is supposed to be permanent. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The leaving and the cleaving is meant to be permanent. You, and, uh, and, and, and folks, don't miss out on this, ladies. You get to leave too, okay? In fact, what, the, what did, they didn't say so much there was because in that day, you simply went, okay? You were gone. You were part of the dowry and everything else, and you were given away, okay? You, and, and, and God's made you more valuable, more important, more significant than the way culture used to have it. So the bride simply... They, they now became the wife. Oh, but, but see, it's meant to, you both leave and you both cleave to one another and together you become one. You're, you're stuck together like with super glue is what God wants for you. It, it, it's not supposed to be broken. These two, have, they've been meshed together and they've become one flesh and, and, and that's the way marriage is meant to be. It's a, it's a sexual oneness with an exclusion of sex with anyone else, and that includes porn on the internet and anything else like that. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body for this reason. A man will leave his father and mother, and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. The Bible has every marriage relationship between a man and a woman. God has made us to be complementary of each other. God has made us to literally unite physically, spiritually, emotionally with one another. Marriage is a gift from God. Marriage is a responsibility. Marriage is love and respect. And marriage is supposed to be permanent. And we live in a fallen world. And the question I have for you this morning is what, what should we obey and what are you going to obey? What are you going to use as the guide for your life? Scripture? Culture? Experience? Emotion? Temptation? How many of you have ever heard of a gentleman named Penn Jillette? He's a comedian. Very liberal comedian. Very political. In fact, recently he's been on the Honda commercial where they're cutting the, the two comedians and magicians. They're cutting a Honda. And have you seen that one? I think it's Honda. Is it what? I think Honda, right? Somebody say yes. yes. Or no if I'm wrong. <laughs> anyway, they're cutting it in half. It's a red car, okay? And so, so well, Pendulette says, some years ago, Penn actually had somebody come up to him after one of his uh, shows. He said, I really like your show, and I want to give you something. And that guy gives him a Bible. Penn Jillette's a liberal. He doesn't believe in God. He's an atheist, okay, very staunch atheist. He's talked about that. He's talked about, he says, the, the, he, he believes that the Bible is one of the six most, the best books that he's ever read. But he says, one of the reasons why you'll become an atheist is if you read through there and you read about what God did to the, to the people in, in Israel times and killed people, and then you read that God sent his son and killed him too, you'll become an atheist. That's what he says. Okay, well, Penn says this guy gives him a Bible. And he goes on in a rather long conversation about this and what this meant to him. And he said, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. Oh. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there is a heaven and a hell and people could be going to hell, and you think that it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? Yeah, a lot of evangelists have used this, his phrases. And yeah, I remember one day I was listening to him and he was talking about, yeah, man, a lot of Christians have really used my phrase there. But, but seriously, if you really believe what you really believe, shouldn't you go tell people about it? 
He goes on, he says, how much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, there's a certain point where I run over, I tackle you, and it is more important than that. Everlasting life. Look, if I really care about people, and I really believe the book here, and the truth that's in this, and I'm going to really follow this, and I'm going to care enough to say, whoa, stop! It's going to kill you if you do that. And I'm going to talk to them about everlasting life. See, here's our challenge. And boy, this is growing. One of the, one of the things that's being said is that if you speak against homosexuality, that you're mean-spirited, you're a bigot, you're unloving. Folks, if you love God and you love another person, won't you share with them what you believe? And won't you do that, though, because you love them? Or will you simply say, you know what, it's okay, you just do your own thing. Will you say to a couple, you know, hey, go ahead and have sex with other people because it won't matter. You know, just have some fun. Maybe it'll help you to appreciate your spouse more. Go try out some porn. It'll make your sex more exciting. Really? And be, but hey, okay, I'm not telling you to do any of those things. <laughs> make it clear. Don't misquote me, okay? <laughs> but what I'm saying is, if we really care, if we really believe God, won't we do what His Word says? March 10th, 1985. When I stood in front of that congregation, I made a commitment that I would follow only the word, only grace, and that I would faithfully obey. And it's costly at times. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the gift of marriage. My heart hurts for those who have chosen a lifestyle